Okay, it sounds like we are. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening for what promises to be an incredibly stimulating, uh, perhaps even controversial talk. We'll see. Uh, what, do nuclear weapons matter? It's a, it's a controversial uh, question to be sure. My name is Curtis Brainerd. I'm the managing editor at Scientific American. Um, I am particularly thrilled to be here tonight. This is really a first of its kind event between uh, foreign affairs and Scientific American and uh, just couldn't be more pleased about the subject that brings us all together today um, because this is an area around which uh, both magazines have a long and proud and distinguished history. Scientific American was founded in 1845, if you can believe it, a full century uh, before the, the, the first and only nuclear weapons uh, were ever used in, in warfare. Um, and um, we have published uh, throughout the atomic age. Um, in fact, uh, you know, this gave me, a, I'm always pleased to have an opportunity to dip back into Scientific American's archives um, and was, was so pleasantly reminded that um, uh, folks like Ernest Rutherford, uh, who, who first split the atom, wrote for us uh, just a year before that, that tremendous feat. Otto Hahn, Hans Beth, um, Niels Bohr, you know, these, these, these towering figures of the atomic age from the early to the mid 20th century who, who charted the course uh, that, that, that we're still on today have all uh, graced the pages of, of Scientific American and this continues to be a major focus of coverage uh, for our magazine today. Um, and of course, uh, the same is true of, of foreign affairs, a central pillar of uh, coverage here. And what, what really brings us together is of course this outstanding cover package and the November, December issue, um, again with the uh, a provocative title, Do Nuclear Weapons Matter? So um, Gideon, let me uh, start with you. Uh, well, actually, sir, let, me, let me introduce our panelists first. We have Gideon Rose, the editor of Foreign Affairs, uh, next to him. Elbridge Colby, the director of de the defense program at the Center for a New American Security, who served as the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Force Development across 2017, 2018. And finally, uh, to my immediate left, Nina Tannenwald, the director of the International Relations Program at the Watson Institute for International and Public, uh, and Public Affairs at Brown University in Rhode Island. Um, so Gideon, you know, back to you. Um, you know, I, I took my turn to, to give a brief history of Scientific American's uh, coverage in this realm. Um, perhaps you could do the same for foreign affairs and tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, this, this provocative headline and, and how you approached uh, the crafting of this package. Thank you very much, Curtis. It's a pleasure to be here and <clears throat> it's a delight to be able to um, have this panel and to do this collaboration with Scientific American. Um, when I was in graduate school, the Bork hearings came up, and I was I had to teach uh, uh, American politics um, to undergraduates, and I was teaching court cases, and I was very curious about this whole question of is he in the mainstream or not, and I read all this stuff, and I realized that although there were many, many, many people who felt that Bork was not in the mainstream, he was they all had different reasons for thinking that. And so instead of having it be like lots and lots of people opposed to one small one, it was actually a much more interesting fight about what how should we interpret constitutional doctrine? And I always remembered that. And when we were thinking about nuclear weapons, the iconoclastic take of someone like John Mueller, who, whose piece leads the issue, um, that these things are completely overblown, that both the hawks and the doves who assume that everything is balanced on a hair trigger and that we're one step away from being conquered or being blown up or blowing up somebody else, that in fact the lived history of the nuclear era has shown that things are much more robust and much less uh, uh, easily blow upable than, than many have assumed. This was his argument. Everybody's reaction to that kind of argument is, oh my God, of course that's crazy, of course that's ridiculous. Everybody can agree that it's wrong. But if you start picking apart the arguments, they disagree for very different reasons. And so the simplest way that I would put what we were trying to do in this package is if you take John Mueller's argument and Nina Tannenwald's argument and Bridge Colby's argument, no three of them can be correct, right? No two of them can be correct even, right? You have to sort of pick one of them. And so you can't just say Mueller's wrong, but I don't really agree with this one because each of them has a different kind of thing. And so what we did was we tried to portray Everybody who dealt with nuclear issues during the Cold War, 
knows that after, when the Cold War ended, the nuclear file just got shoved to a back burner. And nobody stopped, kept talking about the issues. The academy largely forgot about it, the policy. And so two worlds emerged, a world of actual normal foreign policy and diplomatic affairs and military affairs in which this stuff went forward, the normal business of world politics, order maintenance, international relations, and so forth. And then the nuclear world, off on its sort of little side things with people who were specialists in that, who obsessed about that, who felt that was the most important thing, and who basically felt that they were keeping the world from blowing up. But the two worlds increasingly didn't talk to each other, and the debates among the nuclear crowd sort of essentially never got solved. And so we decided, gee, it's been decades since the end of the Cold War. What really is the significant uh, learning that we've achieved? What are the key questions? And how important are nuclear weapons and what should we do about them? Because the origin of this came in the spring when I got really, really pissed off at all the Korea stuff. Because basically, we were all told during the course of the last you know, year and a half that the world is about to blow up, we have to throw everything we're doing out the window and rush to make sure that North Korea can't get a slightly additional bit of increment with its nuclear and missile programs and that this was so important that we should even risk going to war. And the only question was, should we go up to the brink of war and hope they back down, or no, go all the way and do it first? And I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, I am not at all clear, and I've got a PhD from Harvard and look at this stuff, what the actual added value of a little bit of technical improvement in the North Korean missile and nuclear weapons programs uh, represents, and why that's such a great danger. We know they went to war. We went to war over Hawaii. Why do we need to? Why do we care about Maine or or uh, Seattle? And uh, we know we'd go to war over Japan. So why do we even necessarily care about Hawaii? And what exactly is the added difference? And I realized that there were no good answers. There was just the nuclear crowd of either side coming and saying, "You have to pay attention to this, and this overrides everything." So we decided to do a package that would essentially say, "No, everybody make their case." for why this is important or not, and what should really be done. And so we assembled, essentially, an all-star collection. Okay? Nina Panerwald makes a wonderful argument for the classic kind of case saying that you've essentially been luckier than we should have, and that all I'm talking about is sort of complacent uh, luck, or, or we've gotten by, but it's not assured. right? Bridge represents an entirely different kind of argument that's similar in its structure, but on the opposite kind of view. Scott Sagan's piece basically says, no, you know, Korea really is important, but not because it's a universal thing, but because it's Korea and a very specific kind of thing, right? And then um, the two regional pieces, Caitlin's piece and, and Olga Oliver's piece, are wonderful regional nuclear pieces of a kind that used to be normal and now are not really uh, common because we don't really have a lot of nuclear capability and regional military and practical policy stuff. So we feel it as a sort of buffet offering for all the people who might want to think about nuclear weapons, from extreme skeptics and radicals to all the conventional wonks of different flavors, each of whom can find some value to their position being represented, and as we were just discussing beforehand, so that you could actually teach the debate if you wanted to do it as a group. That's what we were thinking, and that's what we were trying to do. Well, that's a fantastic package. Congratulations. And I should mention, we'll talk here for about uh, 30, 40 minutes, and uh, around 6 o'clock, we're going to turn it over to the audience for Q&A. So uh, please be uh, thinking about questions, and uh, hope you'll uh, stand up and ask a few at the end of the time. Um, so, uh, Gideon, um, you know, you really set us up nicely here. I mean, uh, you know, the, the fact that, that no two of the authors in this uh, outstanding package can be right notwithstanding, I think that one thing that we can all agree on here today is that a lot's changed in the last 10 years. Um, and that um, the specter of nuclear conflict, as, as you have subscribed, has, has come back to center stage. And so um, what, I'd, what I'd really like to know is, you know, after so many years of detente, what happened? You know, what happened? N Nina, perhaps I could start with you. you you've called this, or, or at least facets of this, the great unraveling. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So we can start with uh, 2009 and Obama's Prague speech, which basically uh, pro uh, Obama announced, well, we're going to pursue nuclear disarmament, and this is a moral issue for the United States, and he put disarmament on the agenda for the United States. And here, you know, almost 10 years later, disarmament has completely disappeared, and we're in a new world of arms racing. And so how did this happen? 
and there's a number of factors. I, I think one of the central ones is a resurgent Russia. So Russia under Putin, um, especially after 2014 when Russia invaded Crimea, I mean, Russia is sort of bringing us back to the old geopolitics. <coughs> so you have the return of kind of traditional geopolitical tensions, uh, resurgent Russia, Russia. We now have intersecting rivalries. We have a world of multiple nuclear powers. So the old, the Cold War was basically a bilateral relationship. Now we have a world of multiple, multiple nuclear powers in which there are intersecting rivalries. So there's you know, not only the U.S. and Russia, but there's Russia and China, and there's the U.S. and China, and there's India and Pakistan, and there's India and China, right? And there are these triangles of relationships that are much more complicated. Um, and so in this world, uh, we also have new technological developments, uh, both in conventional and nuclear systems. Um, and this is this, we also have the collapse of arms control. Um, and so you put all these things together, and we have a much... Um, a much tenser world. I think the rivalries are more severe, um, and we are we are less confident about uh, traditional arms control as a means for dealing with these rivalries. Thanks, Elbridge. Oh, great. Uh, well, thanks, Curtis, and thanks, thanks, Gideon, uh, for the invitation and participating in, in the debate. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Um, I'd say there's fundamentally uh, a, a structural explanation. Um, the uh, Russia is sort of the more pointed reason that, that uh, nuclear weapons have reemerged in the international security environment, but China is the more fundamental structural uh, shift. Um, fundamentally, the post-Cold War world was one in which the United States was a kind of the unipolar or sort of hyperpower force, as the French foreign minister put it back in the 90s. So um, neither the Russians nor the Chinese nor anyone could pretend to actually take on the Americans with respect to our uh, allies or established partners in a way that would kind of plausibly allow them to attack uh, uh, those, those protected allies, which, by the way, in the Cold War had been the, the fundamental uh, intellectual and strategic challenge that had foreign affairs had, had played such an important role in. Um, so, to, you know, two, two basically things happened. Uh, first, or kind of uh, if you think about it, um, the Russians uh, grew alienated uh, progressively by the post-Cold War order. You could kind of maybe start with Kosovo, to some extent, NATO expansion, Georgia, and then finally 2014. And they de essentially developed a military that, unlike the Russian, the kind of uh, moribund Russian military of the 1990s, was able to present a plausible theory of victory uh, against uh, the new U.S. allies in Eastern Europe. And of course, there's a, there's a profound alienation, particularly after 2014, but in some senses uh, uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And the Russians have emphasized nuclear weapons significantly in that plausible theory of victory. Because they are so much weaker than the United States and NATO, they can present a local threat and then seal the deal with nuclear weapons, as I kind of lay out in the piece. The more fundamental reality is the growth, growth of China, and that's defining both in China's own growth and the degree of focus that it will require from the United States. So basically what ha what's happening is in the international political arena, you have the reemergence of great power competition, and that is a byproduct of this more uh, uh, sort of uh, balanced uh, world, world power structure. And in some sense, I think the last 25 years was the exceptional period in, in, in history rather than the period that we're living in now. Now it's a question of trying to manage the world that, that we're coming into in a way that's stable, in a way where we have effective deterrence and defense. So in, in terms of this world that we're coming into, um, you know, so we've come down this road that, that you've both described so well. Um, so where, where are we now? Is, is, is this deja vu or, or is this does this have all the hallmarks of the, the Cold War of the 20th century, or is this in some ways fundamentally the same, fundamentally different? Uh, Tina. Well, it's not quite the same old Cold War. I mean, there was an ideological uh, conflict then that we don't have today. Uh, and so is it the same threat as the Cold War? If you're talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think it's not as great as that. Uh, but... People like Secretary of Defense uh, William Perry are saying that um, in the NATO-Russia uh, conflict that the threat of new use of nuclear weapons is higher than it's ever been since the Cold War. So there's a lot of concern about tension in that relationship. I mean, the world is, is different today, right? It is not just bipolar. It is more complex, right? So the threats are coming from different areas. It's not just Russia. Um, it is China as well. And right, so it's not simply the bipolar 
relationship that the United States has to focus on, but a much more complex array of threats. And if we throw in non-state actors into that, um, that's quite a complex mix. And that makes it much harder to figure out you know, who you're deterring, where you should be focused on, how we deal with Iran and North Korea while also deal, dealing with China and Russia, and then uh, reassuring our allies. So it's a, I think it's a more complex uh, picture than it was during the Cold War. I'd say there, it's different from the Cold War. In some sense, again, the Cold War was the unusual period in human history. That I think the kind of the post World War One to the end to 1991 was in hi, a highly ideological uh, uh, sort of period in human history. And you've had periods like that, like the Confessional Wars of the 16th, 17th century, the French Revolutionary Wars. But most, probably, most periods of human history are defined by interstate competition that is not as overtly or not as kind of saliently ideological. And I think that's the kind of area that we're likely entering into where ideolo ideology is a component but not as defining as it often seemed to be uh, during the Cold War. And I think there are two fundamental differences. One is the stakes actually are lower uh, in a way. I think there was a perception during the Cold War, certainly in the earlier stages, that a victory by Soviet communism and essentially monolithic communism, as the Cold War went on, it became much more complex world with the Chinese as an independent actor and so forth. But I think there was a perception that victory by, by Marxist-Leninism in Europe and so forth would be a defining kind of irreversible uh, defeat for kind of you know, human civilization and so forth. Today, the Russians and to some extent the Chinese, it's much less clear that their ability to assert their dominance or hegemony over, over kind of the, the regions in question, the Western Pacific and Eastern Europe, are so significant, which, by the way, actually makes war potentially more likely. The other thing that does that is actually the nuclear weapons are much less salient than they were in the Cold War. During the Cold War, there were 40,000, something like 40,000 nuclear weapons on both sides, 30 to 40,000. There were thousands of nuclear weapons littered all over the, the European landmass. So basically, there was no way. Now, there was a lot of thinking. Uh, one of the reasons I think John Mueller is, is wrong, although he's, you know, he has a point, uh, the, the balance was not as delicate as some people say. But one of the reasons he was wrong were there these pr continual imagination of wars. There were imagined wars that were going on. If you look back and you read the pages of Foreign Affairs, people were thinking about it. They were worried about it. That's why it didn't happen. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I think that we need to get back to what I call Cold War thinking in the best sense, which is we think about it and then it's unlikely to happen rather than ignoring it, which makes it more likely. But the fact that there were nuclear weapons spread all over the European landmass meant, and I, I had conversation with a former Soviet general a couple of years ago, uh, which was striking. And I said, why didn't, for instance, the Soviets try to push more uh, in the 70s once they had parity at the nuclear level and superiority in conventional forces in the European theater. And he said, we could never figure out a way to start a war in Europe that wouldn't go to general nuclear war. You could imagine, I mean, people could imagine a war. In fact, that's the challenge that I, that I talk about. People could very well imagine a war staying conventional or going very in a very limited way to the nuclear level. And again, that all, you know, it's the paradox. Uh, Bill Perry may be right that nuclear weapons use is more likely because it might be very small scale. Whereas in the Cold War, the, the probability was lower, but, it's, but the likelihood would be that it'd be an enormous exchange, which would end, essentially end human life as we know it. So I think we actually live, I hate the phrase, oh, do we live in a more dangerous world? I mean, the consequences of war in the, in the Cold War would have been cat truly cataclysmic. I think in some ways war, the probability of war may be ri ri are certainly rising again if we, because of this nature of this competition. Um, but, uh, but I think it's, it, is, it, it demands our attention. You know, uh, we're going to come, and I know we're going to have a lot to say about this concept of, of, of limited war and, and, and the, 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 the technological advances and the shift toward tactical nukes. Before we do, you mentioned the pages of foreign, foreign affairs, and so I, I think it's a great point. Gideon, I'm, I'm curious, you know, um, the shift that uh, both Nina and Elbridge have, uh, have so well described, um, the, the complexity of uh, the geopolitical order, the uh, ideological underpinnings, uh, the, the stakes, um, do you see that reflected in the, the the pages of foreign affairs. I mean, has this? So, have you seen a, a similar kind of evolution in the coverage of the magazine? The world is going to hell in a handbasket, uh, and nobody knows what's going on. And in that context, I agree that there has been a significant deterioration uh, over the last uh, decade or two <laughs> in the strategic context. And uh, certainly, the liberal international order is in deep trouble, and there are all sorts of worrisome trends in global and regional affairs. So to that extent, absolutely. Uh, how much of that is connected to or dependent on or related to the nuclear file, I have absolutely no idea. And I have no reason to believe 
that it's significant and that it had no reason to believe that it will affect the nuclear file one way or the other. I don't <coughs> think the odds of a nuclear use are greater now than they were five years ago. I don't think they were greater now than they were 20 years ago. I think they've been very low for a very long time because it's been very clear that nuclear weapons are good for one thing and one thing only if you're a rational person, which is essentially giving you a get out of jail free card for your regime from external attack. When you have them, you will not be deposed in a war for regime change. When you don't have them, you are open to it. Look at Gaddafi. Look at Saddam. Look at other kind of things. If you have them, you don't get attacked. If you don't have them, you do get attacked. They have been useless for all compellents. The, have, the extended deterrence has either worked or not been, uh, at least it hasn't failed. Korea has been stable for 60 years in a Mexican standoff with, with artillery weapons and conventional weapons, why the added nuclear dynamic is going to change anything in the region, I don't understand. The Iranians are locked in in a giant structure with lots of other nuclear powers, lots of things. They're already messing around at the conventional level and prevented from actual war from a regional military balance and other kind of things. What the added terrible things the Iranians would do if they got a few ratchet nukes and hit them in their basement, I don't understand. And so the question I have basically is not, is the world a troubled place? Sure it is. I think it's actually going to get better rather than worse. I make the case in the next issue. We can talk about that. There are all sorts of different worlds that go on as we have done in the magazine. My point in this thing is, if I were a Martian coming down, I would not necessarily think that uh, the original views of just how much the nuclear evidence has changed things have been borne out by events. What I would see is something more along the lines of what Ken Waltz wrote about, which is every time you seem to give a couple of these human countries uh, a, a you know, pair of these kind of things, they stop fighting each other. And that seems to work whether it's the United States and the Soviet Union, it seems to work whether it's the United States and China, whether it's Russia and China, whether it's India and China, whether it's Israel and the Arab states, whether it's nuclear, whether it's Pakistan and India. It doesn't seem to matter where they are, how many weapons they have, whether they're safe or not. And so I'm starting to think that after many, many years of being told this, it's all just about to blow up if we don't get our policies exactly right. I, I believed that when I was younger, and I don't believe that now. And without any disrespect to Bridge, because by the way, the arguments they're making, I'm the crazy radical here. These are the conventional arguments that are, have all the weight of scholarship and serious purpose and Huckums and uh, talking about this stuff. But you know, there's a friend that used to tell fables, fables about this French rooster, Chanticleer, and <clears throat> in European history. And one of the things, one day Chanticleer, who would get up every day to crow the dawn into, into being, one day he overslept. And he woke up, and the sun was streaming down. And he went, ah. And he was shocked and hard. And then he was incredibly depressed, because he thought that he had actually brought the sun every morning, the dawn. And when he overslept and realized that the dawn came without him, and that all his crowing didn't really bring the dawn, it just happened to be correlated with the dawn, because he had gotten up earlier. I have no reason to believe that it's our theoretical war plans calculated on both sides that have been carefully, metaphorically keeping things on a balance because if they had ever gotten just ahead like the Western Front, we suddenly would have gone into nuclear war at any time over the next six decades. I just don't see that. And I don't see any reason why that's going to change now. So I think the world is a crappy place with all sorts of conflict, all sorts of trouble. But of all the daringest things on the agenda, the nuclear issue isn't the one that keeps me up at night, except for Caitlin's piece, because the US-China blundering into a war that could then go nuclear because of interlocking plans. That strikes me as the kind of plausible danger I can get really scared about. I see Nina and Elbridge both looking very eager to respond yes. here. So Nina, My job here is straight down, attack, straight so down, so down to, them up to explain yeah. why I'm yeah. an idiot. So, so I'm, I'm not sure what's, what, what's your real point of view and what you're saying right. for purposes of argument, but um, I think the view you present is correct to the extent that you're saying, you know, when countries make rational decisions, they won't rationally choose to go to war. I mean, Kim, Kim Jong-un is a rational guy, right? He's not going to launch a nuclear attack against the United States sort of out of the blue, right? He knows that. I think the issue is precisely in the China article. So is the, the issue today, the concern that people have about the rising chance of a use of nuclear weapons has to do with risk of miscalculation or inadvertent use. Okay. And if you think about the example of the Hawaii false alarm in January, uh, last January, where the Hawaii emergency alert system sent out a text me message and several times it said, alert, there's a Russian ballistic missile coming in, 
this is not a test, and repeated, this is not a test several times. And people had about 36 minutes to kind of, you know, duck and cover until uh, the correction came on the air and that it was just a test. Um, uh, that is how we could get into nuclear war. Imagine that if President Trump said, um, tweeted, um, every, all Americans <coughs> should, should evacuate South Korea. And if it was a particularly tense moment between the U.S. and North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un could mistakenly take this as a signal that the, new, the United States is about to launch a nuclear war. So I think the China article in the issue uh, is really good at uh, discussing where the new risks come from. And they come from the entangling of nuclear and conventional capabilities, dual-use capabilities. When you have a cruise missile that can have a nuclear or a conventional weapon, or like in China where they have their nuclear subs and their conventional subs operating in the same control system, um, operating near each other, that if the United States attacks China intending only a conventional attack, uh, China may lose the ability to control its nuclear submarine. Um, and then you, you, you basically have brought, you, you, you basically, it provokes China to respond uh, with, a, with a nuclear strike. Similarly, if you're using a cruise missile and the target can't tell whether it's conventionally or nuclear armed, they have no way of knowing that, uh, then potentially the country will will respond with a nuclear attack. So that I think is the modern risk that is very that is different from the old days and has to do with uh, both develop developments in both conventional and nuclear technology and how countries are using this. From my perspective, I think the best my my goal uh, I think the number one goal should be to prevent the use of nuclear weapons. And one of the ways to do that is to actually separate your conventional and your nuclear forces very clearly so that the target um, is not confused about what kind of weapon is coming at them. So I disagree with that. And I, I, I also with, with Gideon, who I think, I think was being provocative because um, actually if you take what Gideon uh, is saying, he's sa what he's saying is a conventional recitation of the nuclear revolution, which is that nuclear weapons buy you security. All you have to do is assume that an irrational actor has that and then may have revisionist or revanchist uh, objectives and then may think about how they can use the caution that is created by the nuclear revolution to actually achieve their objectives. So as I, say, as I write in my piece, it's not that the nuclear, I think it's a, it's a fallacy to see the nuclear as a kind of independent domain. I think Gideon's absolutely right. There's a famous article that ran in Foreign Affairs called The Delicate Balance of Terror. Now there was more to it then because of basing structures and so forth. But I agree, the, 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 the strategic balance is quite indelicate, and I actually make that point, and that's why I go after what I call the super hawks. I differentiate from their position. I think at the strategic level, the balance uh, between states over the possibility for a massive nuclear exchange is extremely resilient. That's why I disagree with Nina. I think the pro you know, accidents, risks, these kinds of things are very important, but actually that's, that's, that's not the most significant, significant challenge. The most significant challenge is a state that listens to Gideon and says, ah, if I have nuclear weapons and I move, I've created a new reality. And by the way, if you go back and you read Ken Waltz's famous argument, I believe with Scott Sagan, he doesn't know how to deal with the Iraq problem. If, if Saddam Hussein had attacked Kuwait with nuclear weapons, Gideon's, Gideon would be checkmated. So that's what essentially what, the, what I'm worried about with the Russians. Wait, give me a second. That's what they're dealing with the Russians, right? Is the Russians, the Russians aren't gonna say, I'm gonna blow up America first. What the Russians would do, and this is the escalate to the escalate doctrine, is they're gonna, confuse the issue with their little green men, say in the Baltics or something like that. Then they're gonna move in with their conventional forces, which is gonna seem very legitimate. You know, it's gonna, they're gonna shape the, dis or confused, right? And there's very little that we can do uh, if you look at, say, what the Rand Corporation has done. And then they're gonna use the defensive aspects of the nuclear revolution to deter an American counterattack that would be necessary, the, the, the vicious, broad uh, attack. Now that is the challenge, and a wholly rational actor, only if you think rational actors are extremely cautious would you, would you be sanguine with that interpretation of the nuclear revolution. My, my point on that is, another point is, how long was it between the Great Depression and the financial crisis of 2008? And in some sense, wars and, mar and the market are not that distinct, right? People are looking for arbitrage opportunities, they take things for granted, right? They start to, they start to think that things are just the way it is rather than a product of deliberate policy and so forth. So, you know, it could be the rooster but it could be 2008. If you look at, the, at, the, at the, the time between the great wars of the, of the Napoleonic period 
and the First World War, that was 100 years. Now, there was, there were, there was Crimea, there was the uh, Franco-Prussian War and the Austro-Prussian War, but those were short, relatively sharp wars. So I say, um, basically, I, I tend to be a rationalist when I, look at the, when I look at the world, not to say that people don't behave irrationally, but I look at the world and I get worried when I see that a rational actor could actually see a nuclear world and try to manipulate uh, uh, it to its, its advantages. And actually, the entangling point is exactly that point. Often, states would entangle precisely to create the kind of caution. If you're so worried about nuclear risk and misperception, for instance, for instance, if you look at what the Pakistanis are doing. By the way, the Pakistanis, states sometimes start wars like, you know, uh, uh, the Egyptians in 1973 or, you know, something like that, or, or Bismarck's wars. Often, they push the envelope harder. If you look the way the Pakistanis have been dealing with the Indians, it's true that there has not been a major war uh, for, for over a generation, but Pakistan has launched a very large, or, or uh, allowed very large terrorist attacks to go on. They have continued to support a uh, insurrection uh, in in Kashmir, or whatever you want to call it, whatever the proper term is. So I think I think Kashmir. we need to, yeah. I think we need, or I mean, the insurrection. I don't know what the right term is, but I think we need. To, I think that's that's the real problem. And and Gideon is absolutely right to say, oh, you know, the Russians having a few more nuclear weapons than we're that that's not a big deal. What's a big deal is this, this particular problem where, where states could have a rational theory of victory for going after us. Okay, I actually think, by the way, first of all, this is why you go to grad school to enjoy this kind of stuff. No, and this is, this is the best discussion of, in plain English of contemporary nuclear policy that I've been to in ages, so it's really fun. And this is why we did the package and why we did the event, because we aren't having these kind of discussions and we should. That said, um, I've been hearing these damn arguments for literally decades. And at what point do we say that is a plausible risk, but I'm not going to do something really crazy to head off a notional danger? And the kinds of, I, by the way, I agree we should separate uh, uh, the, the nukes from the conventional things. I think that's a, I, precisely for the dangers that Caitlin talks about. And By the way, I so largely forth. agree with that too, okay. actually, but for different <laughs> I, reasons. I don't actually. agree, I don't yeah. agree with, the, with, the, with the tactical nuke stuff. Yeah, anyway, I figured. Um, uh, because I just don't think there are that many people on the other side who are looking at our arsenal and calculating this very carefully and looking like that. What I, but I, what, I re what really pisses me off <laughs> and what really is important and what none of you are necessarily saying is that uh, the Korean, no, that, 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 that we should, in, I was on my honeymoon and in 94 and was nearly brought back in the honeymoon because we would nearly literally sort of launched a preemptive strike against the North Korean nuclear uh, weapons program. And if Jimmy Carter hadn't sort of sauntered in and done that. <laughs> and I was watching this and going, they can't really be doing this, you know, reading the IHT back in the day. And like, even to this day, I can't look back on that and go, what the hell? We were about to literally launch a, Preemptive strike in the North Korea. I just think, in retrospect, that I thought it was mad at the time, and I think it's even madder in retrospect. And I think that the idea of various kinds of preventive action um, that we're thinking of taking, where we keep discussing taking with both Iraq, uh, Iran, and Korea, is uh, far greater risk of our own actions producing real disaster than the threat that might or might not emerge. And with one last thing with regard to the uh, Iraq scenario. Barry Posen did a wonderful article, mm -hmm. uh, which I think has not gotten the attention it deserves in the academic literature. It's, what if Saddam had had a nuke in the Gulf War? And Posen's argument was, let's say that Saddam had completed his nuclear program six months before rather than six months later. And essentially, what he would have done, right, he would have, might have done the same thing because he was aggressive, thinks, now I'm going to feel my oats, I can go out there. And Posen makes the case, we would have had to behave exactly the same way because you couldn't have let him take Kuwait if he had nukes, because that would have meant everybody in the world now knows your aggression can be legitimated if you have nukes. So he would have had to oppose the invasion of Kuwait, but he would have gotten a get out of jail free card. So yeah. Posen's argument is if Saddam had had nukes and did exactly the same thing, we would have ended a negotiated solution to the war in the same way, except in a cleaner, simpler way in which he would have been pushed out, but we would have left him alone. And I think that the idea that even if there is an attempted use of nukes to be aggressive and use that as cover, in the real world, it's not going to succeed because we can't let it succeed and we're still strong enough to make everybody else toe that line. No, no, it's a 
Right. I know you want to respond, but let me, we got to move into Q&A shortly, and I got to get, get in a question uh, for the Scientific American readers in the, in the, in the room. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's worthwhile to step back and at, at this point kind of look at the technological underpinnings of this, you know, of everything you're saying about the risk of, uh, of nuclear conflagration and the, and the way that technology influences that. So without question, the, the, the number of nuclear weapons uh, in the world today is greatly diminished from the height of the Cold War. We've reduced our stockpiles. Yet every major nuclear power uh, is modernizing their arsenals. What does that mean? What does modernization mean from a technological perspective? And how does that affect everything that we've just discussed about? And, and, and does it matter? I mean, ultimately, is, is, is technology moot at a certain point? And, and really, the size of, size of your guns uh, becomes irrelevant at, this, at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I mean, I think technology is tremendously important, particularly at the conventional level, and I think this is relevant to Gideon's point. I mean, most of what we need to do in this context is actually about defeating these nuclear theories of, or these kind of theory, integrated theories of victory is actually at the conventional level. Uh, and that's where a lot of the, tech, a lot of the technology and the, and the, and the sciences are, are, are need, to, need to help, which is that fundamentally the Americans, if we are going to preserve the world order that Gideon's talked about, we have to be able to project power over very long distances and take on adversaries who are very large and sophisticated themselves. So we need technology to be able to do that. In the nuclear domain, there are technological and scientific problems still to be worked on, but a lot of the science, is, as I understand it, and I don't uh, generally, is, is quite mature. So I think, I think the, the military and defense and deterrence domains are extremely uh, key for, for science and technology, although it, probably they won't be as concentrated on nuclear as they were in the, in the Cold War. Nina? Yeah, I mean, I think technology is tremendously important here. I do think, however, that um, you know we are looking at a, a new arms race, and uh, it's not necessarily a quantitative arms race, but it's a qualitative arms race in new types of weapons, um, new delivery systems. And I think there's a question of whether uh, we need all this stuff, uh, whether we 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 have um, you know the United States has about 6,500 nuclear weapons. Uh, total uh, that cover the whole range of, of flexibility. I mean, from con you can start with conventional weapons, but but up into the the biggest strategic weapons. Uh, and I think, you know, they say uh, the 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 U.S. Nuclear Posture Review argues for the development of some new missiles, uh, cruise missiles, and some new warheads. And uh, it's unclear why these are needed. And there's a saying in the uh, the nuclear strategy business. You know, you can always come up with a scenario that requires a new weapon that requires a new weapon, and so we have uh, you know the argument uh, in the United States is that we need these new weapons to respond to what Russia is doing, and Russia, of course, is building up its nuclear arsenal because it's weaker in its conventional forces, um, so it's relying more heavily on its nuclear arsenal. The United States is the most uh, has the most overwhelming conventional power. Uh, in the world, and so we would actually be better off in a world in which there were no nuclear weapons, because then we'd be the the only thing that can threaten the, the United States on the battlefield is a nuclear armed state, because in a world of only conventional weapons, the United States would be clearly dominant. Um, so technology is is uh, is part of the problem here, uh, and I think what. We have all these new technologies, this new entanglement, and but there are we we no longer have the uh, kind of um, arms control dialogues or strategic stability talks. So one of the things that that former Secretary of Defense Perry worries about, for example, is that we have no dialogue with Russia on how on these new technologies and what constitutes strategic stability and what constitutes stable deterrence with these new technologies. And so if we're going in these, this new arms racing direction, we need, uh, we need to be pursuing talks with both, especially Russia and China, about how these technologies interact and what constitutes stable deterrence in this new world. And that's not happening. Can I just speak just to Gideon's points, because I think they're important. I mean, a couple points. One is Barry Posen is brilliant, and that's, that's a very important article. That presumes that you had a theory of how to defeat the Iraqis if they escalated in a limited way with nuclear weapons, which is what my article is about. So my, otherwise, if, if the United States had gone in to, now Iraq was, Iraq was a minor power compared to facing the Russians or the Chinese. So that's a much more sophisticated power. And you'll notice that my article is about China and Russia. My fir the first event I ever did at CFR was where I argued against Matt Kranig, uh, against the preventive war uh, against, on Iran. So uh, I, I share your aversion <coughs> to, to preventive wars. I, 
believe in deterrence and defense, but I guess you and I have a different risk calculus from but that. So, so this, is a good, but this is a great example of why this stuff is so valuable, because instead of what we've just heard is there are so many different variegated questions to be worried about, and even the people who are worried are worried about somewhat different things, all of which, by the way, are legitimate things to worry about and have multiple possible policy responses. But the idea that what might be necessary in the nuclear file for Russia, and for Russia, for China, for Iran, for states that don't even have it, for our own policy, those are all sort of separate little kind of things, and that's really just an interesting point. I, by the way, am scared shitless over technology, but it tends not to be in the nuclear area. So, for example, your point about the alert, there's an article in the next issue um, about deep fakes mm -hmm. and talk about mm -hmm. like scary stuff because uh, I guess what I would say is the nuclear weapons don't bother me these days because I don't think they're going to go off if we keep them nice and safe. The other kinds of manipulation and in strategic interactions that technology will make possible and the ways that will screw up warfare and strategic interactions, uh, we're going through a very deep new world. My only point is it's not clear to me that sort of nuclear... I, 3D printing of a, a virus and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or genetically engineering some new kind of thing is, is will keep me up more than you know the next neutron bond development. We'll have to come back and talk about biotech technology another time, which I would love to do. Oh, and absolutely. Let's let's kick it out to the audience. I have a dozen more questions I'd, I'd love to ask, but I don't want to monopolize. Let's start down here. I see a hand up. Uh, The mic, and yeah, just uh, quickly uh, identify yourself. Uh, Galen Gingrich. Mm -hmm. If we keep them nice and safe, a lovely if. I take it that none of you are particularly worried that a non-rational actor will stumble across a loose nuke somewhere and use it for non-rational reasons uh, that cannot be deterred. If you reassure me that I shouldn't worry about that, then I'll leave a happy camper. My feeling on that, I'll defer to the real experts, but my feeling on that is there are some obvious, major, legitimate concerns that the nuclear field has come up with, whether it's you know uh, strategic interaction and strategic instability and bad ways of configuring your arsenals, whether it's safety measures, whether it's loose nuke controls. I think that you know Nun Luger and Graham Allison and all the things we did on cooperative threat reduction were all great things, but I think that particular, my understanding is those issues now are not nearly as worrisome as they would have been, let's say, 20 years ago, when, yeah, they were, when people were freaking out about them. You know, it's a very serious problem, I mean, akin to the bio problem, which is probably more dynamic. I mean, I think it's something that you spend, we as a society and with other civilized societies, we spend a significant amount of money to, to go after the problem, and that's a lot of what our, our counterterrorism enterprise is doing, our intelligence enterprise, and we should be implementing things like UNSCR 1540 and making sure that legal architectures are set up to what, ensure. What is that? Sorry, it's a, it's a UN security resolution from 10 years ago that basically says that people need to take greater steps to control the possibility of WMD terrorism. It is a very serious thing, but when you really think about it, the number of actors that could actually get and mount a nuclear weapon and say break the codes that could protect an advanced state's nuclear weapon, the number of people who would actually be highly irrational is a pretty it's a, you're, you're talking about a pretty small set. It's a very, very serious problem, and we should be spending on it, but it's not the fundamental challenge of, that we face as a nation. And if they're irrational, they may not be good at like yeah. the technical work of the bomb. Right, Think exactly. of um, Shinrikyo, no, right. right? They would have loved to get a nuke bomb, and you know their idea right. of a WMD attack was a, a an umbrella into a bag of sarin on the subway. That's not exactly you know the technical sophistication that's going to blow up a city. Sure, I just I I basically agree with that. Um, John Mueller in in this um, piece, um, I mostly don't agree with him, but on the terror terrorism issue, he's written elsewhere at great length on this. And he's basically laid out a kind of a scenario and where he argues that for terrorists to acquire nuclear material or nuclear weapons, there are about 20 veto points. Uh, and it's actually really hard. And, it, and you could intervene, a state could intervene at any of those 20 veto points um, and prevent this. Um, and it, it's really qu quite compelling. And so I, I agree with Bridge here that, you know, we should be spending money on this. We should be doing, you know, due diligence on this, but we should not be inflating the threat here. And this, I mean, so the, the, maybe this is a good time to mention the national defense strategy, which really enshrined <coughs> so in a way, you know, released earlier this year, the defense strategy said that interstate strategic competition, not terrorism, is now permanent, uh, is now the primary concern of U.S. national security. And I, I would take it you, you agree yeah. with this. General director. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I certainly do. Yeah, I mean, this, yeah, I, I, I would. I mean, I think the fundamental idea here is, um, 
you know, and I think the state's coming back with a vengeance. I mean, I think 25 years ago, people were talking about the invention of the internet, the state was gonna wither away super empowered individuals. We see that's not true. You look at, at China's ability to exploit the internet. States have the ability to exploit military and economic power. And a large state like China in particular, being able to leverage its economic, political, and other forms of power, that changes the world. That changes the way things are done, and that changes our lives in a way. You know, terrorism, we've gotten used to, there, there, are, there are potential for horrific events, but it's more, I mean, this is where Mueller's right. It's, a lot of this is up to us and how, we, how resilient we are, how we respond to it. I think we should have a forward-leaning posture on terrorism, but fundamentally, that is within our power to control within a certain range. I mean, you don't get rid of, you don't get rid of crime. You can bring crime down, as has happened in this city, but you're not gonna get rid of it without living in a society that's unacceptable for and not, not consistent with our values. So I, I think uh, that's certainly the, the logic. And the, and the reality, I, I differ with Nina quite, quite significantly on a very important point, which is that the United States conventional military advantage, as the, as the national defense strategy says, as the Department of Defense says, has been eroding. So it's not a given that we would dominate. The, the, the key, we, we, are, we could get in a war with the Chinese or the Russians, particularly if they th think they have a plausible uh, war to fight. And so what is that? We could get into a war. How would that happen? How would that happen? So uh, Xi Jinping just went down to the Nanjing military region uh, and said, you be ready for a war over Taiwan. Uh, the military balance on the, across the Taiwan Strait has been uh, eroding from our point of view for many years. Uh, the people of Taiwan are not interested in unifying with the, the people on the mainland. The United States has the Taiwan Relations Act and the Six Assurances and has a history of of going to Taiwan's defense. When you were working in the Clinton administration, uh, they commendably uh, sailed carriers through the Taiwan Strait to, to push back on Beijing. Um, that's a recipe for... Uh, How does the war start? Uh, the war starts because uh, any number of things. Xi Jinping feels politically uh, threatened. So the There's Chinese attack movement. Taiwan, that's what you're saying? Yeah, it's possible. So the, sure. the scenario is yeah. the Chinese attack sure. Taiwan. Absolutely, it's possible. Out of the blue, go out and just basically do this. I just find that a very, rather, you know, uh, <laughs> unlikely scenario. Well, I mean, the fact that you find it unlikely, they practice for it, they're building for it. So, we I mean, practice war with data. We are not going to fight the Soviets. We never intended to blow up the Soviets. I mean, we, we, we were doing it But people practice. Do you think the Soviets, do you think the Russians will attack NATO? I think the Russians, if they saw a potential and if the, if the circumstances were advantageous, they would do it. Yeah, they would think about doing it. Yeah, for sure. Well, they certainly think about doing it. Yeah. Let's, let's get another. Yeah. So I, I took one from this side of the room. Let, let me come uh, But you don't believe war is possible. Here, toward then. the back of the room there. I think deterrence works. <laughs> <laughs> I think nuclear deterrence works. I'm more pro-nukes than you. Oh, uh, yeah, the way, yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Alex Donahue. Um, I'm also a Air Force veteran, had a background in nuclear security uh, in Montana and Interlake. And my question, doesn't necessarily pertain, and I'm a student at CUNY, uh, doesn't pertain to necessarily as a nuclear deterrent between this bilateral uh, old Cold War, Russia and the US and all these other things and Pakistan and India. And my question more or less relates to security of nuclear weapons, such as, let's say there was regime change or a collapse of, uh, this, I know this was a discussion during the Soviet Union, when it collapsed, let's say North Korea collapses, um, how do you guarantee that you're not gonna, let's say, have a surrogate take it and use it for other means, or a rogue military faction where, let's say, North Korea has a break off in the region? Because um, you have nuclear weapons, but the another part of nuclear weapons, such as deterrence, but it's also securing the nuclear weapons so they don't necessarily have a, uh, a leak and you have a dirty bomb go off, where, let's say, a rogue actor takes them. That could be possibly somewhat irrational. And that's another factor in nuclear weapons, I believe, that um, is something I've kind of been concerned about and, and thinking towards. Um, and I was just curious what your perception is about something like that versus just, you know, direct conflict of nuclear warfare and missiles flying back and forth and so forth like that. Mm. Nina, you want to take this one off? Sure. I mean, this is a very important issue. Uh, I mean, one case that I might lose sleep over at various times is Pakistan. Uh, and whether um, there are kind of jihadi elements within the Pakistani military who might um, stage a coup or somehow uh, gain control of, of some Pakistani nuclear weapons. So, um, I mean, this is an issue that the United States has very, been very concerned about in ma making sure that states have centralized control over their nuclear arsenals. Uh, we are confident that India does. I think we are you know, reasonably confident that Pakistan does, uh, but there are some reasons to worry. Um, Kim Jong-un is obviously a dictator, and uh, I mean, it would be devastating for him if, if um, he lost control of his nuclear weapons, uh, because uh, I think if, 
states were probably, you know, there would be attribution to North Korea if any kind of loose nuke got out. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that states have a strong rational control, right, rational interest in maintaining control of. Uh, but it does remain an issue, and the Obama administration held a series of um, security summits for <coughs> summits to try to strengthen state practices around um, nuclear materials generally. Uh, those have come to an end, but they sort of heightened the issue of safety and security around nuclear weapons. It's, um, so it's an, I mean, it's an ongoing issue. Let's let's narrow in on the issue, right? Because a a weapon, as you know better than I do, a weapon that is adequately protected and under control cannot actually be detonated absent the provisions for detonation, right? So, the question then is: there's the possibility for for a dirty bomb, which is basically conventionally exploding the material, which is a very serious event, but orders of magnitude less serious than a nuclear weapon. So that's that's a question of maintaining the security of the weapons, physical weapons themselves, and uh, radioactive material. Then there's the question of what if, is there a, is there a universe of, of possibilities where states might actually not want to have security provisions for some reason? And I think the main probable reason for that is if they fear something like regime change, which is another reason why the United States should not be in the regime change business, but should, for instance, be willing to threaten regime change in the ultimate and, and the most devastating consequences for something like that. That if, that if a state like North Korea or Pakistan does not provide adequate provisions, then that is something that really would be cause for us to really go to the mat. <coughs> and I think that's what, and then, then that gets, I mean, Tom Schelling years ago, who was the granddaddy of nuclear deterrence theory, Tom Schelling wrote about should we per be sharing what are called permissive action links, for instance, which are the security provisions you can put on bombs. Now, there are a lot of issues about that because will the uh, recipient uh, accept it? Is it worth helping them with their program? There are lots of issues, but fundamentally, a state that has the capability, to your point, sir, the state that has the capability to build a weapon is generally not going to have an interest in letting something just go go willy nilly, but but it's an important problem. But it's it's one we're work, we've worked on for many years, continue to manage. Could I sorry, uh, right right down here? Yes, Mary Gorman. Um, I'm just going to um, preface my question by a statement by Joseph Rotblat, who I'm sure you're uh, familiar with. He um, uh, was with the Manhattan Project, a brilliant physicist who quit the moment he heard that uh, Germany had stopped uh, developing a nuclear uh, atomic bomb, many things. Anyway, he said, for the first time in human history, we have the technological means to quite literally wipe ourselves off the face of the earth. This is largely the result of the work of scientists. This fact must be constantly reiterated. But even now, many scientists feel that the application of their work is none of their business and that they are committed to conduct scientific research for the sake of science. Some scientists may say, quote, we have the capability to make bombs that can destroy all the cities of the world, but how these bombs are used is no concern of mine. That is for others to decide, end quote. And he says, I believe that this is an immoral attitude, yet today many scientists think this way. And to me, it seems like you're this discussion is a little bit once removed from actually the essential problem because we wouldn't have nuclear weapons if it weren't for the work of scientists. And after all, you know, science is uh, sort of transcends borders, so some of this argument shouldn't necessarily have to even be. Well, uh, what, is, what is your uh, take on this? <laughs> and, and before I turn it over to the panelists, I just want to thank you for asking this question. It really, you know, strikes as something near and dear to my heart. One of the things that was on my list is, um, <coughs> So in 2017, um, when the UN was negotiating the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, 30 Nobel laureates uh, and over 3,000 scientists from, from 84 countries signed an open letter to the UN in support of these negotiations. And they wrote, quote, we scientists bear a special responsibility for nuclear weapons, to your <laughs> point, since it was scientists who invented them and discovered that their effects are even more horrific than, than, than first thought. Um, and of course, many of the scientists involved in the Manhattan Project and other operations were horrified in the, in the, in the height of the Cold War about the advent of thermonuclear weapons and, and the escalation and the, the technology. Um, so with that said, um, love to hear what your thoughts are here. Uh, look, there are all sorts of ethical positions you could have on this subject, and certainly there's a long and strong tradition of moral dissent on various aspects of the project, and certainly the, many of the scientists involved have every right and obligation, and have felt this to be 
proud uh, members of the community either dissenting or taking part in the policy process and so forth. And so everything that uh, uh, Rothblatt was trying to get the uh, scientists to do, uh, I think we all would agree with as being positive. On the other hand, it's not so simple as to say, oh, those bad nuclear weapons, because you have to ask yourself in the real world, well, what would the world have looked like if there weren't nuclear weapons? And I would argue, because here's where I disagree with Mueller, right? I don't think that war, I don't think they've been completely useless. I think they've been good at stabilizing, I think they're hedgehogs. They're stabilizing at some kinds of big things at the great power level, and if you can get their benefits without their downsides, they're pretty good. So the fact is, I mean, we did a wonderful exchange in foreign affairs in the mid-90s between Steve Miller, and uh, John Mearsheimer about whether Ukraine should give up its nukes, right? The, the post-Cold War, uh, the, Russia was getting all those nukes back and they wanted uh, Ukraine to give it up. And so uh, Steve Miller said, oh, you should, give, of course, give them back. And uh, Mearsheimer, because we want to avoid the loose nuke problem, you don't want nukes there. And Mearsheimer said, look, the real question here is not nukes. The real question here is Ukrainian security. Russia is a big, strong country with a giant conventional army and a giant thing. If Ukraine gives up its nukes, how will it defend itself against Russia? The answer is it'll probably have to develop a very large nationalist army on a conventional level to establish deterrence. And that would be even more provocative and difficult. So I think we should let them keep their small few nukes because that would keep the Russians at bay without having the need for an arsenal. Everyone thought, oh, Mearsheimer was crazy. And of course, we gave the nukes, the nukes went back. Everything was fine. We signed a little Budapest memorandum, didn't really mean much, and everything was fine. And then what happened? Russia basically decided, no, we don't like it. And they went and they took back Crimea. They took the, and the fact is, without nukes, you are vulnerable to being invaded by bigger, stronger countries. And that's the basic reality that is a good thing rather than a bad thing for world stability. It's why we haven't had global nuclear war and global conflict, great power war between nuclear powers. Well, I basically agree with. Gideon's larger point, although I think actually, even if Ukraine had a small arsenal, I'm not convinced the Russians wouldn't have gotten away with a seizure of Crimea. This is where Barry and others are, are wrong, which is, you know, they raise good points about the difficulty of American extended deterrence commitments, but you know, most Americans here don't want to die for California either. So at some point, there are lines that have to be drawn, and they have to, and that's the project that I'm working on here, is trying to make our alliance ex architecture and partnership architecture uh, credible. And the reason that nuclear weapons aren't proliferated, of course, to the Japans and the Germanys and blah, blah, blah of the world is because the United States extends that defense umbrella. Uh, Ma'am, I, respectfully, I, I disagree with you that, that nuclear weapons are, are you know, sort of self-evidently immoral. I think morally justifying nuclear weapons is, tr is tremendously difficult. It's actually something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I think there are ways of doing it, and actually that's one of the reasons for a certain kind of limited nuclear war uh, uh, thinking, but I think, you know, at, at the, this is a bit consequentialist, but at the most basic level, we have lived through, as Gideon rightly put it, we have lived through a period without great power war. I mean, the number of people lost to conventional war, I mean, you know, Nina's talking about Bill Perry's comment, which I disagree with actually militarily speaking, but he's basically talking about making the world safe for conventional war. That was the world that we lived in 1939, 1945, 1914 to 1918. Herman Kahn, who is a famous delicate balance of terror guy who thought you needed to build up more and more nuclear weapons, even he admitted if France had had nuclear weapons in 1940, the Germans probably wouldn't have invaded the kind of arsenal that they have, they have today. I mean, even a guy like Hitler, and Kahn was a skeptic of the, of the viability of nuclear deterrence. So, you know, it dramatically raises the cost of, of major war, but that very fact by necessity makes people more sober about it. So what I'm worried about is being able to go under the envelope, go under that, that threshold, an aggressive power to go under that threshold and to try to change things before you get up that level because nobody has an interest. But I, you know, and I, I agree, scientists absolutely should be part of the conversation, but I, you know, science does transcend national borders in some ways, but it doesn't in others. I mean, science is also put to the service from a military point of view, an economic point of view. So we need to think responsibly, and I don't think the ban treaty is the way to do that. Nina, I'd love to get, hear, hear your thoughts here. And also, just uh, we were talking before, and I, I'd asked Nina um, a question. I kind of reframed your question. I asked, you know, to, to what extent do scientists carry weight in, in foreign and nuclear policy today? I mean, you, you know, we think back, uh, you know, almost 100 years ago when Albert Einstein was signing on to a letter that was delivered right to Roosevelt's desk. And I wonder if, you know, such a thing would ever happen today or what kind of weight it would, mm -hmm. would carry. So um, you had an interesting answer to that and, 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 and also to the extent mm -hmm. you'd like to weigh in on the uh, previous mm -hmm. comments. So, so thank you for your question. I, I think that's a really important one. And... Scientists are in, have been involved on all sides of this issue. So scientists, of course, contributed to creating weapons. But his, during the Cold War, scientists were also uh, played a very key role in developing the idea of arms control. 
and being involved in figuring out verification schemes um, and arms limitations. And they continue to play that very important role. Uh, I think that uh, I'm a daughter uh, of a, a physicist who worked on the H-bomb. And um, he has talked about how in the 1950s, he just thought about the science. But over time, he learned. And um, in the late 1960s, he basically made a statement, along with many other scientists, that he would not do any weapons work anymore. He, that's a personal choice. I think there is much greater awareness today among scientists of public policy and of the public policy implications of their work. I was at a, a nuclear workshop uh, this past summer uh, that's um, basically training scientists and engineers who are going to be involved in some way in the weapons labs, for example, um, doing some doing work on technology. And um, the argument to them was, you know, this is the kind of, you could work in the weapons lab at Los Alamos, <coughs> deliver more and help build weapons, but that's a choice you have to make for yourself, right? It's a moral choice, and if you choose that, you don't want to do that, you know, that's fine too. Um, the question about, you know, whether scientists are listened to today, um, you know, in the current administration, I don't think listens to science in any, scientist in any field, whether it's nuclear or environment or health or anything else. Uh, but in general, I mean, I think, I think scientists do play a very important role in, um, in contributing input to very important and awfully, often a highly complex technological and, and science policy issues. So, you know, Ernie <coughs> Moniz, as Secretary of Energy, negotiated the Iran Agreement. Um, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter is a physicist. Um, and I think one, um, particularly in democracies, one very important role for scientists is... Um, is the role they play as civilian defense analysts, which is not a tradition that countries like Pakistan and India have. So in this country, we have the, you know, the scientists who work for the Pentagon, but we also have the scientists who work in think tanks and who work for groups, advocacy groups like arms control groups, like the Union for Concerned Scientists. Um, these, having a, a cadre of civilian um, um, science analysts is incredibly important so that you know, they feel free to, to make arguments that don't agree with the government, right? They criticize government policies or they disagree. India and Pakistan are only beginning to have these kinds of groups, right? There are some civilian analysts. They are quite constrained. To, up until more recently, they mostly always argue the government position, right? They defend <coughs> Pakistan nuclear weapons or the India's nuclear policy. And so it's a learning process for them to, to create that cadre of independent analysts who can who can function as a critique of the government's policies. And that's, that's a very important role that, that they, they play here and, and, and we hope will play in other countries as well. So we're almost out of time here. Um, we are going to have a reception afterward with cocktails. I hope you can all stick around and join us, ask further up questions. I just want to give our panelists um, a, a minute each, no more than a minute, um, for some closing remarks, um, really kind of geared around, I think, uh, you know, based on everything what, uh, that we've been saying here tonight, you know, where would you like to see the world head, uh, you know, in, in a, you know, five to ten year horizon, you know, 15 year, whatever time horizon you think is necessary to, to, to get us to where, where we think we, we need to go next? I have no idea where the world's going to head or what <laughs> we should, you don't know, should or head, you, or but uh, what I will say is I really hope that there are cadres of trained, disciplined, intellectually serious analysts able to engage the issues at each stage along the way. And the most worrisome aspect of this uh, set of discussions over the decades has been the demise of a strong, serious community. Because just as Nina said that you know the Indians and Pakistanis are starting to come up, we used to have a very lively American discussion of serious values. And it's not clear to me that oh, these guys are like sort of they're like my diplomatic historian friends. They're they're the remnants of what used to be a great field that now is not necessarily <laughs> as developed. And I wanted to thank Nina and Bridge and the other members of the package because they're carrying on traditions that it is not clear to me that we have, we're training future generations to address these questions with the seriousness that they were addressed in the past. And there's enough truth to what Bridge said and what Nina said about the, uh, the safety stuff about how there has been a lot of good work and discussion among analysts 
outside the state of how to deal with the nuclear challenge. And it would be very, very depressing if what used to be a good, lively American strategic community discussing these things dwindled out and faded away because nobody cared about it anymore. And so in that sense, that was why we did the package to show people. I think the Stanton Foundation is doing yeoman work in this regard in terms of funding all sorts of, the Olin Foundation kept security studies going for a long time in the dark ages of the 90s and afters. And I think the Stanton Foundation is helping do that with nuclear stuff. And I, I, I'm very delighted that uh, these guys and people like them are still writing and producing serious work because it's uh, it's what we used to learn from, but it's not clear that there, there are, we couldn't do 10 panels like this because there aren't 10 pairs like this you could do it with. Um, well, I feel like uh, Balboa or whatever coming out of the Amazon or something like that, a lost tribe or whatever, but uh, no, uh, thank you very much for the for including me in this. It's been a great conversation. I think the kind of point I'd, I'd leave you with, and I actually I worked uh, closely with a wonderful guy who was a Marine officer who won the Silver Star in, in the Middle East, and he said the difference between you and a lot of uh, senior Marines is that you think a war with the Chinese or the Russians is, is possible, and uh, many of them don't. And I think uh, you know that's the kind of the key issue. I think when you when you really get down to it, is uh, in a world of nuclear weapons, could you imagine somebody not just going directly to war, but meaningfully risking war, uh, and and for some for some kind of ra actual rational reason and. Um, I, I think I certainly could, and I think if you look at the at the military forces that that the Chinese and the Russians are building, uh, and the exercise they're doing and so forth, it signifies to me that they are prepared to potentially do that. Doesn't mean they're inveterately aggressive. If they were, I'd be really despondent. I rather I think they're they can re they respond to incentives, and so if we think seriously and we continue to imagine these wars, then we're less likely to have them uh, uh, actually come to pass. And so that's what I'm trying to do. So I think uh, nuclear weapons have not been used since 1945. And this fact, this 73-year tradition of non-use of nuclear weapons is the single most important fact of the nuclear age, that these weapons used once have never been used since then. It's the most important thing we can do is to preserve that tradition. I think the most important thing we, we could do is to prevent the use of nuclear weapons. And our policies should be focused on that. What we're seeing right now, I think, is all going in the wrong direction. So we have uh, policies that uh, are re-legitimizing nuclear weapons. There are doctrines uh, that are lowering the threshold for nuclear use. There are new kinds of weapons, uh, low-yield, small nuclear weapons that potentially make the use of nuclear weapons more usable. So we have a, a renewed salience of nuclear weapons, uh, not only in the US, but in the United States, in Russia as well, uh, and in other countries as well. And I think um, this is quite a reversal uh, from the direction the Obama administration was trying to take this, which was to ratchet back the role of nuclear weapons, uh, to narrow the circumstances in which they would be used. He didn't quite arrive at a no first use policy, um, right, but to, to unbalance, to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. security policy, to move toward um, conventional alternatives and, and sort of strengthening the conventional component of extended deterrence. Now we're we're really going completely in the other direction, and you know Trump has sort of said, "Let it be an arms race." Um, it's going to be a world of nuclear excess, right? Where we throw off arms control limits, we're going to spend you know 1.7 trillion dollars on uh, weapons over the next 30 years, right? This is a, uh, the nuclear posture review is this enthusiastic embrace of an arms race. And this I think is a very dangerous direction to go in. And 